What's up, y'all? Coast to Coast Podcast here, coming at you live, L-I-V-E. Uh, no tenant rate comments, just, you know, coming to you live. Talking all sorts of things around the transfer portal as it pertains to UNC basketball. And Sherelle McMillan is with me, and we are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. So, y'all, I appreciate you making time for us, whether you're watching us live here on YouTube, on IC's YouTube channel, or uh, if you're getting this in your podcast feed. Either way, we're glad you're here. We appreciate you making us a part of your uh, regular consumption of info, and we we enjoy doing this for you. So, hopefully, you guys enjoy what we're doing. If you're not, let us know. You know, Give us some feedback. If you are liking us, drop us a good review. Give us some, some five-star love. We'd appreciate it greatly. Uh, Sean Moran is not with us tonight. Uh, everything's fine. He is just attending OJ Simpson's funeral. So he will not be with us, uh, as we record this here, uh, this here podcast, but Sherelle, uh, as we're sitting here on a Monday night, April the 15th, first off, did you get your taxes done, man? They are done and filed. So we made it. Well uh, done. Look, look, Ma, we made it. Yeah. That's uh good on you for doing that. And shout out to all of the, um, all of these CPAs out there, like my uncle uh, down there in Southport doing the tax thing. I know you guys are, are getting run to death right now. So um, shout out to all the CPAs and everybody who got their taxes did and paid the government and did all their, did all the work they were supposed to do. Sure. Let's talk about some transfer portal stuff. I think before we can go there though, we need to talk about the fact that, well, we're still waiting on the decisions of uh, two of UNC's, uh, potential returning starters or guys that were starters this past season uh, and Harrison Ingram and RJ Davis. So we should caveat the show with that. We're still waiting to hear from those guys. Uh, Cheryl, what, what kind of updates do you think you can give us with regard to how that process is going and, and what, what sort of timelines they may be on? Yeah, that is kind of the million dollar question right now. I think for everybody, I, I, I would, I would posit that the UNC staff probably has a, a good feel for uh, what's going to happen or, or what they think is going to happen. I'm sure they've had multiple conversations. I, I shouldn't say I'm sure. They have had multiple conversations <laughs> with RJ Davis and with Harrison Ingram uh, over the past week, and I, they probably have a good gauge on it. Uh, I think, you know, Heber Davis was seen over the weekend uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, RJ Davis was there for, I forget if it's the Wooden or Naismith Award, uh, being a, a finalist for that award is Zach ED1, but it was a big ceremony there. Heber was out there with RJ Davis. Uh, one could look at that. I think Ben Sherman pointed this out as kind of, you know, taking a visit to your most important recruit in the offseason. Uh, so you definitely know that he was there to support him, but it doesn't hurt that, you know, RJ's considering returning too. So really, uh, timetable wise, I, I think it is getting a little late for them, not because Carolina is not going to wait for them or because, um, you know, there's there's any kind of real deadline. The only real deadline they have is in a couple of weeks when they have to enter the draft if they're going to. But unofficially, I would say, in kind of like an unwritten rules thing, if you're going to the NBA, you have to prepare like early and you have to drop everything and go to training basically 24-7. And so in talking to some folks, they are a couple of weeks behind in that aspect. Now, obviously, they could probably catch up, um, but you never want to be two, three weeks behind on training, the NBA and G League Combine start in less than a month. Um, so if they're going to, they probably would behoove them to go ahead and, and make that move either way, um, you know, imminently in, in the very near future. So still waiting for them. And then, you know, Carolina is uh, out in the portal talking to guys and, and seeing what shakes. Well, so let's let's get into that. And I want to shout out to everybody here in the in the chat, we already got 300 people with us live tonight. Um, listen, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that you guys want to know. We understand that. We appreciate that. By the same token, uh, Inside Carolina cannot spoil our relationship with sources that we have just to kind of drop some knowledge on y'all because we're doing a live show. Uh, if you've learned anything about how General Sherman and, and Buck and the rest of IC operates is that we're not going to go out and say something unless... Uh, it's been vetted and double sourced and confirmed. So just hang tight a little bit. Um, you know, Sherelle's going to give you as much as he can. Uh, and we'll try to make sure that you guys at least take something away from this show tonight, uh, even if it's not the questions that you're asking, wanting answers to right now. So Sherelle, I'm going to refresh something that you've said a lot of times 
And it's really been ratcheted up quite a bit this year with how North Carolina operates in the transfer portal. Um, there's a lot of things happening that just because we have not shared what's happening doesn't mean things aren't happening. I'm going to say that again. There are a lot of things happening. And just because Inside Carolina has not shared or confirmed that they are happening does not mean they are not happening. Cheryl, one good example of that would be uh, North Carolina's, you know, discussions or, um, you know, what have you with Jonas Adu, big man from Tennessee. Let's start there. So I, I'll, I'll start there, but I want to give everybody like kind of a look inside of how we do things. So the names that you see, like Joey said, that, that we are confirming or, you know, putting on the premium board as a portal name to know. I don't want to say it's exhaustive, but that is the result of like multiple conversations with multiple people to nail down that this is in fact true. So our our because of our vetting process and the way we do things, which that's the way we choose to do it. Not everybody chooses to do it that way, and that's their right. But because we choose to do it that way, we can't kind of report everything that we hear. We have to report what we can confirm. So there's a you know there's that little subtle difference. So the names that you see are the ones that we confirm, but we know. Um, and I think any reasonable person would know that they're talking to other guys. It's just that we haven't been able to confirm it through our process that we like to use to make sure everything's on the up and up. So just want to give you the difference between those two things. Stay there. Um, I think with, Hang on. Stay there a second. Yep. Yep. It's really important that people recognize that. There's a lot of folks, and, and Cheryl's going to mention it here when he talks about Jonas Adu. There's a lot of people, especially in this age of social media and, you know, I am heels. 473 Adam on Twitter or, you know, we know heels.com or you know, whatever you want to talk about. Like there's a lot of people who are clout chasing and trying to get attention on Twitter by just putting stuff out there that may or may not be true. Once in a while, they're going to get it right. And most of the time they're doing it just to get follows and, and traction. That's fine. Whatever. If that's what they want to do, you know, Knock yourself out. Welcome to Loser Town. Population you. Awesome. But more importantly is just recognize that if Inside Carolina is going to say something, it's been vetted multiple times and it's gone through the process that Sherelle shared just a second ago. So you believe who you want to believe. But I will say, um, you know, especially if there's if there's folks that are um, if there's folks that are kind of ripping stuff that I see a source on the premium board and posting it elsewhere. Yeah, you're just devaluing your IC subscription. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Drill, tell us how this process specifically has played out in the form of Jonas Adu's discussions with with North Carolina. Yeah, so I think obviously what they're doing, you see that uh, I think we reported this too that they either want a game changer in the post or someone who at minimum could pair in a rotation with Jalen Washington. And I think the portal movement you've seen. Uh, talks with uh, Omar Ballo, talks with uh, Cliff Omori, talks with uh, Jonas, talks with uh, Ahmad Bradshaw, who, or excuse me, Aaron Bradshaw, who committed to Ohio State. That kind of shows you what they're looking for. Uh, I think Adu is a unique case because three years ago, uh, most of us thought that he was going to end up uh, committing to Carolina. It didn't quite work out during the coaching change from uh, Roe Williams to Hebert Davis. And I think it Basically, he entered the portal last week, uh, and Jeff Lebo is the assistant coach who's handling his recruitment, and he reached out to to Jonas, and then he had a call with Hubert Davis, um, and basically, uh, we were told it was transparent, and they talked about what happened last time. I think there were some hurt feelings there uh, between, especially from the from the ADU side. I think uh, Hubert Davis was starting to build that bridge back from where they were this time, pretty much exactly this time in, in 2021. Uh, so from there, you know, there will probably be another call, uh, likely soon, likely tomorrow, more than likely. And then from there, it's all about whether or not he's going to take a visit. And you kind of reset the recruitment after uh, those multiple phone calls are done. It, it, it's a good gauge of, okay, is this, for both parties, is this something we're interested in? Uh, is this something we think can work? And if so, then let's talk about a visit. Now, if it gets to be, I would say, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we haven't heard anything about a visit, then maybe the call, uh, the Zoom call with the staff tomorrow didn't go that well. 
um, if you do see a visit scheduled or uh, confirmed scheduled, then maybe the visit, you know, went pretty well and they're ready to take the next step. But that's, to me, that's the big thing. And it's not just about ADU. It's about really any player. Like, they can be Carolina's top target for 24 hours. And then either Carolina gets a piece of information it didn't have or the player just says, you know what, my mom wants me to go to X. Or the player says, you know what, school Y is offering me this or whatever it may be. And they can be gone. I mean, I think we just saw that with Aaron Bradshaw. I think the Carolina fan base and people reading it kind of got the impression that he was the guy. And and I'm, I'm not going to lie, I kind of did too. And then just that quickly, it evaporated, it was over, and they're moving on. So I think in the Portal era, it's just really important not to get too attached to any one player that UNC is targeting, especially if they don't take a visit. If they take a visit, then you know, it's a pretty good chance that North Carolina is serious, that they're serious about North Carolina, that all those things that we talk about with fit and not looking to get into a bidding war and uh, real NIL, the way NIL was intended to be, all those things fit. Uh, if somebody gets on campus over there, it's just a matter of them making a decision about what school they want to go to. So that would be my unsolicited advice to the Carolina fan base is don't get too attached to a player that we call a, a, a portal name to know or someone they've had contact with. Because just as fast as you find out they have contact, they could not have contact again. It, it happened last year, but don't connect. Uh, Carolina made a call, and it didn't go anywhere from from then. And people kept asking, like, is there anything with UNC and connect? And we're like, we haven't heard anything since that initial call. And it, it, it never followed up. So um, as quickly as they come, they can go. It's important to remember. I mean, you're talking about situations literally as – as fluid as cat pee, right? Like it's, it's all over the place. It's always moving. It's, you know, sometimes it stinks. Sometimes you don't know what's there, but either way it's happening. And I think that it's important that people kind of keep that perspective that this is not only is it moving all the time from UNC's perspective, it's moving, moving all the time from the player's perspective. It's moving all the time from the other interested schools perspective. And then when you also think about the people that are involved in the decision, if there are other folks involved in the decision, it's moving for them. So uh, just keep that in mind as, as maybe, uh, maybe your timeline is not as, as active as you want it to be. You know, things could change. I mean, what was it last year, Sherelle, that on the same day, um, Caleb Love entered the transfer portal, North Carolina received a commitment from Pax and Wojcik. I mean, like there's, it can go from nothing to something really, really quickly. So, um, that was an all time. That was an all time moment. Because I, oh God. I don't know. I I was I, I wasn't mad, but I was just it, we were trying to get the timing was to, brutal. Uh, yeah, the timing was brutal, and it's like Paxton Logic is not coming to replace Caleb Love, and people couldn't understand it. it just happened to happen that way. I mean, uh, we said it yeah. a thousand times on the show, bro. Like yeah. you, you repeated it as you went full Buddha on everybody, and like repeated <laughs> it a thousand times with a very monotone, safe, you know steadily intonated voice because we felt like we needed to because the the knee-jerk reaction is going to be look at the timing um so speaking of visits let's talk a little bit about another guy that's uh that inside carolina has been able to confirm mutual interest with is uh k tyson uh transfer from belmont uh tell us a little bit about kind of where that stands and and what you might know about his skill set or what it may fit or how it may fit with north carolina's uh roster construction He's, I mean, he's a dynamic player, I think, especially his size, his size, you, you pair his size, his shooting percentage and his volume together uh, from three. And I, I mean, I think somebody did, somebody filtered it. And it was like two people who matched the description of six, seven, shoots at least five threes a game and shoots above 45% from three. Uh, so you're getting someone who the 24 seven folks consider the best shooter in the portal. Now, obviously, for whatever reason, there seems to be a, a UNC tax on shooters when it, when they get there. So, but even if he, let's say let's say he committed to Carolina, and uh, he shot forty eight percent at Belmont. So take off eight percent, you're still talking about a forty percent shooter. And what we know about North Carolina is that there's a chance they could lose their three best shooters from last year's team. Um, the only three guys who made you know more than twenty threes on the season, which is Harrison Ingram, Cormac Ryan, and R.J. Davis. You know, Cormac obviously his eligibility has been exhausted. And then Harrison Ingram and RJ, like we talked about before, have decisions to make. So I, I think a shooter, um, uh, I, I hate to label guys as just a shooter, but someone who is proficient at shooting, let's put it that way, um, has been on the, on their list from day one. And they're always going to look to add that, whether it's from a, 
5'11 guard, a 6'7 wing, or a 6'10 center. It doesn't matter. They just wanted to add shooting. And so that's really what I think started the interest um, in Tyson. And then you add in his size and the fact that he's from North Carolina. And they, they really think that he could fit well. And that's why they're, they're going after him so, uh, so hard. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm going to show my age here a little bit, but he strikes me as some of those, uh, as some of the early uh, European players that were first getting to the NBA in like the early 80s. Um, maybe not as big as Tony Kukoc, but he, he strikes me a little bit as Tony, as Tony Kukoc, you know, where he's got that, he's got that big frame. And because he's got such a big frame, that stroke is hard to guard. Um, but again, I'm dating myself here. Uh, okay. So we've reset that pretty well. And again, shout out to you for, for kind of working the phones as hard as you have, uh, to, to keep everybody updated with this. Give me some, uh, give me some other names of folks that, you know, that have either popped on UNC radar and, and popped off or folks that, you know, it's kind of still TBD with regards to, to what you know, as we sit here on April the 15th. Yeah, I think Balo was <clears throat> kind of the big name, uh, someone that Joey has lobbied for privately for some time. Big fan of his, uh, likes likes his physicality and his strength and the way he tries to dunk everything. Uh, he's got a lot of, of schools after him. And I think in this new age, there are certain requirements that some players have for schools uh, that some schools will meet and, and others won't. And I think uh, we'll have to see if he makes the Carolina visit. I think he's got three visits before He's supposed to um, visit the UNC, and we were never able to confirm that he has a UNC visit scheduled. He said he was going to visit, but those are two very different things. Uh, but he's one of the names. Uh, I think we talked about the center's Cliff Amori, who uh, was at Rutgers, another in the Joey archetype, uh, just a big hey man, dude. Who can duck I everything. likes what I likes, bro. <laughs> I, I know. A big, strong you know, dude who's 22, 21, 22, who can dunk everything. Uh, one of the best shot blockers in the country, one of the best rebounders in the country, anchored uh, a Rutgers defense that was solid, even though the team wasn't that great. Uh, so that's someone they have talked to. We know they held a Zoom call, I think, I don't know, last Thursday or Friday with him. Uh, so they're definitely talking to these big bodied centers. Uh, Daddy Wolf is another player from Yale who they've talked to. His, his archetype is a little different. Um, then the other guys, he's more of a, a skilled player at, at seven foot, seven one, uh, can handle, put the ball, you know, take it off the dribble and go to the rim. Only has a couple of dunks, but man, one of them was really impressive. It was like a caught it at the top of the key, crossed the guy over and came in with one hand. Um, so he is he's a skilled seven footer. So that's that's another player that they're talking to. Um, and that's outside of uh, those guys and Tyson. Those are the only ones that I would say has has gotten you know, at least semi-serious from a UNC perspective. So again, that kind of shows you, I think, if you want to infer things, kind of what they're thinking about positionally, about what they need. And I think, again, it's important to reiterate and reset here. Um, let us know what, you know, Sherelle, let us know what we can expect as far as when players have to put their name in the portal. All right. So here we go. Our favorite segment. So, Players had to be in the portal by May 1st. Now, um, they can be in the portal on May 1st, but it might not get out until a couple of days later. And that's because it has to go to the compliance office and the paperwork has to get filed. So some players, they might enter on May 1st and you might not find out about it until May 2nd or May 3rd. But May 1st is the deadline. That's the first time you stop and look at the roster and say, okay, I have an idea of what Carolina's roster might look like. From there, you've got your G League combine and you've got your NBA combine. Uh, those players have to be out of the NBA draft uh, if they want to keep their college eligibility by May 29th, I believe it is. And then from there, UNC starts the second session of summer school. I think it's June 24th. Usually everybody gets there that week before. And then fall classes start in uh, late August and practice starts in late September. I think. We will know 100% with certainty the final roster when fall, uh, excuse me, when fall classes start in August. There's still a chance, no matter what, um, before that, that things could change. But that is the final, final, final deadline is uh, late August for what the roster will look like. More than likely, it'll be filled out. I would say in you know, at least by the time summer school's over. But that's not a guarantee because this past year they had James O'Conquo sign. 
in the middle of July. Uh, so, you know, it's just a long process. I think they've gotten better at it, as we've said multiple times. Um, they really are prioritizing fit and, uh, uh, you know, kind of understanding North Carolina and what it is, why it's important to play there, and juggling those with some of the modern things that players are looking for. So it is a balance, but that's what's unique about Carolina is they're not going to, you know, go all in on one type of uh, way to entice a player. Let's put it that way. They're going to use kind of everything at their disposal, which is the Carolina history, which is the Carolina network, which is, you know, how big North Carolina is as a brand nationally, which is, you know, the Jumpman brand. All those things tie into how players end up at Carolina. Sure, I want to ask you something. I'm going to try to do this in a way that, that allows you to answer without putting yourself in a weird spot. Um, regarding players that are already on North Carolina's roster, is there any reason for you to think, uh, the players that are not named Harrison Ingram or RJ Davis, is there any reason for you to think that those players still have decisions to make or that, uh, that there could be additional departures from, from North Carolina's roster? How, how would you respond to that? I would say that there is no finality with North Carolina's roster before the transfer portal closes. So, while you might think someone is back, and we may think someone is back, don't count on or or start doing lineup projections or minute projections until at least May second. Because well, that kill, that kill half the threads it, on the message boards, bro. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> <That's> we've <laughs> seen it multiple times where where a guy was like told us was like, hey, I'm staying. I wanna I wanna um, come back and and get better and compete, et cetera, et cetera. And then three weeks later, the night before the transfer portal closes, you see that player's name in the portal. That's happened multiple times. So my suggestion is, um, or, or I guess my read on it is, is nothing is final. So, you know, maybe there's some guys who have decisions to make. I, I don't know. We haven't heard anything, but I just wouldn't count on anything until May 2nd. And I know that's frustrating because that's two and a half more weeks or 16 days or whatever it is. But I think that's the only way you can accept any potential late departures is just assume, don't assume anybody is back until May 2nd. Yeah. I, and, and again, it's just, I, it's just, like I think it was Cal Perry. He was like, I talked to the roster. There, there is, is no, no roster. roster. Or, yeah. I, talked to, I talked to the team. There is no team. Like there's a team, but there's not a team until May 2nd. And that's, and that's actually a, a great way to put it regardless of how you feel about Cal. Um, I think that there's probably a way if if folks are just dying and jonesing to to have activity between you know now and when things start becoming more crystallized and when there is some finality, I'd suggest go to johnnytshirt.com. Uh, if you could hit Johnny T-shirt up and, and spend some time there, that would absolutely get you through uh, some of this time as we wait for decisions to be made. Um, Johnny T-shirt right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Hey, you might be coming to Chapel Hill to watch the. Uh, baseball team host Coastal Carolina tomorrow, Tuesday night. Go by Johnny T-shirt on the way. Tell him we said what's up. Tell him Sherelle said hello. Tell him Joey said hello. Uh, they have connections back to our crib in Hope Mills, North Carolina, and they'd probably love to hear that. So give Johnny T-shirt some love. We appreciate all they do for this show and, and all of Inside Carolina's content. And um, just want you to stop by and, and, and help kill some time. Go in there and drop some coin. Use your premium message board discount code and get an extra 10% off whatever it is you decide to buy at Johnny T. I'll uh, take a quick break, let the national guys drop some ads in here. We'll be right back for the 500 or so of you that are watching this live here on the Coast to Coast podcast. All right, Sherelle, um, we've seen a lot going on without anything actually happening with the transfer portal. So we know that there's going to be some, some really big uh, seismic things that happen relatively soon with regard to North Carolina's roster. Uh, what I would like to ask too is what's happening on the high school circuit. I mean, it's just, it's so weird that, um, so much energy and time has to be focused on re-recruiting your roster and then bringing back more, you know, more people to, to fill in gaps for your current roster. Oh, by the way, you still have to recruit high school players too. Um, I saw a, a, an update about, uh, Darren Peterson earlier. I think, um, I think that was a name that, that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, wanted to see what you could share about either him or anybody else that's on uh, that's on North Carolina's uh, it's on North Carolina's high school radar anyway. It's wild. I was talking to some people earlier, and they were like, 
portal recruiting is cool, but high school recruiting or, or recruiting in general, I just don't have any interest in anymore. And I think that's kind of the feel I get from since the transfer portal has been open. That's kind of the feeling I've got from coaches around the country. I mean, the first year um, that it was open, a lot of coaches just didn't even go to some of the AAU events. They were like, I, I've got, and this is before the schedule we have now. They were like, I've, I've got a kid in the portal who's going to visit. Why would I go look at, you know, somebody who might not be able to help me next year? Uh, so it is, I think, a unique balance for schools, especially like UNC, because it's going to be difficult for them moving forward, I think, to um, target, recruit, sign, and retain, you know, those players who maybe aren't ranked as highly, uh, you know, outside of the top 25. And top 25 is an arbitrary number, but kind of the guys who maybe aren't ready to, for a major role as freshmen. It's going to be interesting because a lot of those guys are transferring either after one or two years. So you're not able to watch them grow or, or develop them over the course of time. They're going to sit for a year, decide that that's not for them, and then they're going to you know bounce somewhere else. So if you look at UNC's offers, I think really outside of Brady Dunlap, which was kind of left field around this time last year, it's all top 25 you know, elite guys. Uh, so I think you are sh seeing a, a model shift for Carolina. Um, we talked about it many times with the 2025, how they basically have offers out to like seven of the top 10. And I think it's eight of the top 25 or something. And then keeping tabs on a couple other guys in the top 25. Uh, I would say the main ones are the ones who took official visits. That's kind of where you start. Uh, it's Coa Pete, that's uh, Caleb Wilson, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's Jasper Johnson. Uh, so those three, uh, all ones you watch. Koa uh, plays on the Adidas circuit, uh, as does Darren Peterson, who you mentioned, and then Caleb Wilson and uh, Jasper Johnson both play um, on the Nike EYBL circuit. We'll see them next month in Indianapolis. I, I would say, um, you know, since they took the official visit, that's the only one they can take to Carolina. So they have a good understanding of of what UNC is. Uh, and I, I think I would say North Carolina is in, in, in decent shape with them, but, you know, it's just high school recruiting is kind of not top of mind for most coaches at this point. I mean, there was there was like you said, there was a, events all weekend and it just was completely off the radar. Nobody Crickets. paid a lot of it. Nobody paid a lot of attention to it. Yep. There were some writers there, but most everybody is using um, all of their resources to re recruit the portal right now. Uh, but, you know, I, I would say that's how you can look at recruiting moving forward. Expect UNC to continue with the guys in 2025. And if you're looking at offers for 2026, based upon what they've done the last year, it's probably going to be those elite top 10, top 15, top 20 guys. Uh, and then they'll every year kind of work the portal and go from there. Uh, that seems to be the model that they're approaching all this with. And it makes a ton of sense if you can take a step back from the the norm and what we're used to and look at it that way. I think I think it makes a lot of sense to from a, a logistical standpoint, but also from a priority standpoint for, for coaches and, and program building. One thing I wanted to add, Joey, and this is kind of going away from high school a little bit, but I, I, I mentioned this to you, but I didn't give you the topic on purpose because I wanted to get your real, you know, guttural instant reaction. But I, w I was talking to someone else um, who has a son who plays, you know, plays college basketball. Mm -hmm. And basically they, they were like, you know, this group of kids, I guess from 2019 on, um, who grew up in the transfer portal era along with COVID, they've never really been taught or educated about everything that the portal kind of exemplifies and means. So what that what I say when I say that, it's like for I don't know 60, 70 years, if a team has two guards, and um, if if I'm on a team and the team has two guards and two forwards, and they're like, hey, Johnny, we think we're going to bring in maybe a wing, and we're going to bring in a guard, too. In, in any other time in history, it would have been like, I understand, Coach. You know, you don't want to be stuck in case somebody gets hurt, and you want to make sure that there's plenty of playing time for everybody. Uh, you know, we get it. You want to keep us fresh. We get it. But I think now the player mentality, because they haven't really been schooled about why coaches do things and why decisions are made and, and communication breaks down, is, well, Coach X doesn't believe in me. He's not giving me playing time, so I'm out. And while I do think it's important that players have that opportunity to you know, explore their options, because coaches have it too, so players should have it as well, mm -hmm. I think there needs to be 
I don't know if it's the NCAA. I don't know if it's coaches. It probably can't be coaches because they're self-interested. They'll mm-hmm. always end up kind of giving guys advice that helps them. But there has to be some kind of independent group who like just talks to kids about the portal and what it means. And, you know, you it, it might look good, but, you know, have you thought about X, Y, and Z? And I don't think a lot of these kids, whether it's their parents or advisors, are having these conversations. And it's not, I don't think it's anything uh nefarious is the only word i can think think of i don't think it's anything bad or or uh you know necessarily dastardly that the parents or the guardians are are trying to do yeah Yeah. salacious i think they just don't have the information do you does it feel like that to you or my off base dude i felt like that since since transfers became a thing a couple of years back And, and i'm gonna sound like an old man here and i'll be that that's fine um what scares me is when you look at the number of names that are put in the transfer portal every year and you think you're like, Oh man, there's so many guys out there. And then when the portal closes and everybody lands with their favorite team and fans stop looking at who doesn't land, like you stop looking at the game of musical chairs and find out who doesn't have a chair to sit in. That's the cautionary tale that somebody needs to be telling. Because if you go back and look right now, at the number of players that entered into the portal for whatever reason last year. It could be for more playing time, it could be because of coaching change, it could be because of yada, 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 whatever. The fraction of them that don't end up in other Division I schools or just end up out of school and out of college basketball altogether is growing every single year. That's what scares the hell out of me. And if I'm putting my dad hat on, that's the stuff that if I've got a kid who's playing, you know, basketball at any level and they're, you know, they're considering college or they're in college. I mean, that's the thing you have to look at is, man, the grass ain't always greener. And sometimes as we're seeing now, there ain't even grass, right? Like you've got people who are transferring because they don't like their situation. They've never done. And again, I know I sounding, I'm sounding like an old man, get off my lawn, but you've got kids who are leaving because the adversity they're facing in their situation they just think that's what you do. You just up and leave. And it's just, it's, it, there's not a second half to the story for them. And I hate that. And there's no, there's no real reason for the NCAA to tell that second half of the story. There's no reason, like you said, for the coaches to tell it. But somebody needs to give these people the other side of that coin and say, look, just because you're leaving doesn't mean you're guaranteed a landing spot. And that's the scary part and the scary, I guess, dark underbelly of what's happening in this transfer era. Transfer era. Yeah, I, I don't think you're being old man at all. And and I think the idea of it only being an old man thing, well, old men typically have a lot of wisdom. I'm a lot smarter now than I was at 21, like much, much smarter. And the perspective that you have, um, you know, when you're older, I think it informs how you think other people should, uh, you know, handle things. And I, I just think it, it's a it's a balance, right? Like it's difficult. Yeah to say, well, if you're in a bad relationship, stay in a bad relationship. I don't think that's what anybody's saying. No, that's but also, not at all. But also, it's not like you, you can't just abandon ship at the first sign of adversity. You know, maybe the second or third, sure. But like the first time something goes wrong and you're like, I'm, I'm out the door. I think that is, that's not a good message for anyone. Um, and, it, and that's what I'm saying is conflicting because like, I do believe the players should have the freedom to go. Absolutely, absolutely. But it's, but it's like just because you can doesn't mean you should. And well, I, I think what are you a lot looking of, for? Right, right. Why are you leaving? Yeah. What are you looking for? What are you expecting? And I think a lot of times uh, these players are making these decisions without knowing or having a clear idea of what they want next. You and I can right. both say, I want a better, I want a better relationship with my coach. Okay, what does that mean? Or I want more playing time. Okay, how much more playing time? What does that mean? And if you're leaving with these arbitrary decisions, it's just like you and I doing anything in our lives. If we don't have clarity about what we want, you're going to make a bunch of half-assed decisions off the hip, and they're not going to land the way you want them to. And what we're seeing is that's translating now to a bunch of younger kids with a lot more things at stake. Yeah. And it is, again, I don't think it's a fault of their own. I think they just haven't been given the tools really to, let me take that back. I do think part of it is their fault, but also they haven't been given the tools to handle this new era. I mean, think about it. Like Armando Baycott came to college. There was a transfer portal, but you had to sit out for a year. There was no NIL. There was no, you know, collectives. We didn't know what any of that stuff meant. There, he wasn't going to be on a TurboTax commercial. None of that existed. And that was five years ago. 
So the the sea change over that time, I, I think it's just been so much. You, you've the NCAA and college sports has gone through more change, I would say, in the last five or six years than probably the previous forty. Absolutely. So you're condensing all that into that short amount of time. And of course there are gonna be victims. There there's gonna be people who fall through the cracks. And I, I don't know, I hadn't really thought about it that way um until that 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 uh parent mentioned it to me and it, yeah, it makes a lot of sense so I, I think as we're discussing the transfer portal and discussing why kids do things which sometimes don't make any sense i also think we need to recognize that they don't have a, a they don't have a full data set of information to to follow to make these decisions because it hasn't been created yet and even this, an even scarier thing is that there's no impetus for anyone around them to have a full data set either. Uh, oh no, and I think yeah. that's, that's the that's the long story. You know, I mean, if 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 I were making these types of decisions, I'd probably reach out to somebody who was an expert in the field. Um, I would probably call somebody like Congruity, uh, because I would want them to come in and help me make decisions like this, help me make seismic uh, adjustments in my business, and help me be able to to kind of get through and know the real landscape of what's going on around me so that I can focus on making a good decision. You know what I mean? Uh, and I think that that congruity does that for a lot of small and medium sized businesses every day, hit them up congruity, HR forward slash Tar Heels, take that free assessment for your business. They will tell you how they can help your small or medium sized business, save money, become more efficient. And then you can get back to focusing on profits, making money, whatever it is that fires you up about your business. Uh, Sherelle, I'm going to consider that was our two cents for tonight um, because we we left on a really, really good topic. I feel like uh, I feel like you shared a, a a bit of really good insight and hopefully folks will walk out of here feeling like they got something unless I'm going to crack the door a little bit. Is there anything else you want to you want to throw out before we get out of here? Maybe a parting shot, if you will. Um, no, not really. I, I would say uh, just patience. The same thing I've always said during this transfer portal time. Uh, is just don't judge. Look, look at the big picture. Judge the plan. You know, don't judge each individual move. Judge the plan. Uh, that's how I think you should look at things. Uh, that's why <laughs> the NFL draft in two weeks. Whenever everybody gives up draft grades, I'm like, you don't know if player X is going to be good, but did you execute on the plan that you set out to do before the draft started? So was it like, hey, we needed a running back and we needed a left tackle and we wanted to get uh, deeper at linebacker. If you accomplish your plan, then I can't really knock your grade on individual players because no one knows. So that's what I would say for UNC. Their their plan uh, that we've detailed was they wanted someone to either uh, be in a rotation with, with Jalen Washington or have potential to start. They wanted to um, add shooting and they wanted to continue to prioritize fit and basketball IQ into what they've already do and whoever is going to return from the roster. So as you're as May 2nd approaches and all these deadlines approach, I would urge everyone to, again, not judge the individual player, like passing Wojcik wasn't a Caleb Love replacement, judge the overall plan of what they're trying to do. And then we'll see what happens in the fall with the individual players. All right. Well, I'll consider that uh, your two pennies for the night. Shout out to our friends over at Congruity. Um, that's our two cents. Look, man, appreciate you doing the show. Um, I hope Sean has had had fun saying goodbye to the juice. Uh, we will uh, we will be back here if there's any news to break regarding North Carolina's roster for next year. Obviously, you know where to find us. Uh, we'll be on Inside Carolina's right here YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be posting podcasts. But if you need information, go to InsideCarolina.com. This is the perfect time to be a premium subscriber. If you're not a premium subscriber, man, you need a you need a thousand lashes with a wet noodle. Um, but uh, go ahead and make that premium subscription. There's some really good benefits going on right now. You can find that on IC. Go check it out. As always, I'm grateful for Sherelle uh, and all of y'all that joined us tonight. Almost 530 of you on a random Monday night uh, talking about the portal at Inside Carolina. Uh, that's kind of fun. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time. Shout out to John Sigley for producing. Uh, shout out to Sherelle. And I am just Joey Powell. We'll talk to you next time here on the Coast to Coast podcast on InsideCarolina.com.